Hello and welcome to Ogmore by Sea Church's Reading the Bible Together. My name is Dom, I'm the pastor of the church, and it's great that you can join me as we continue reading through the book of First Chronicles. We've reached chapter 19, and you can see our previous reading sessions on our church YouTube channel. But we ought to pray before we dive in, so please would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and we ask as your children, that you would speak to us, that you would help us understand what you have said, what you are saying. Help us to believe, help us to receive. Humbly we ask that you would speak. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Right, so First Chronicles chapter 19, verse 1. In the course of time, Nahash, king of the Ammonites, died and his son succeeded him as king. David thought, I will show kindness to Hanan, son of Nahash, because his father showed kindness to me. So David sent a delegation to express his sympathy to Hanan concerning his father. When David's envoys came to Hanan in the land of the Ammonites to express sympathy to him, the Ammonite commanders said to Hanan, Do you think David is honouring your father by sending envoys to you to express sympathy? Haven't his envoys come to you only to explore and spy out the country and overthrow it? So Hanan seized David's envoys, shaved them, cut off their garments at the buttocks and sent them away. The idea is to humiliate them in a visible way so that it'd be obvious sending a message. It's interesting, isn't it, how... Shaving their faces is a sign of humiliation. There's a biblical arg argument for growing a beard right there. Uh, but cutting off their garments at the buttocks. Mm. It's pretty embarrassing. Verse 5. When someone came and told David about the men, he sent messengers to meet them, for they were greatly humiliated. The king said, Stay at Jericho till your beards have grown and then come back. When the Ammonites realised that they had become obnoxious to David, Hanan the, the, and the Ammonites sent a thousand talents of silver to hire chariots and charioteers from Aram, Aram, Naharaim, Aram, Meaka, and Zobah. They hired 32,000 chariots and charioteers, as well as the king of Meaka with his troops, who came and camped near Mediba while the Ammonites were mustered from their towns and moved out for battle. They realised they poked the hornet's nest. Now they need to suit up. Verse 8. On hearing this, David sent Joab out with the entire army of fighting men. Joab was a bit of a beast when it came to fighting. And we've already read, I think, about all the numbers of the fighting men. And it is a force to be reckoned with. Verse 9. The Ammonites came out and drew up in battle formation at the entrance to their city, while the kings who had come were by themselves in the open country. Joab saw that there were battle lines in front of him and behind him, so he selected some of the best troops in Israel to, and deployed them against the Arameans. He put the rest of the men under the command of Abishai, his brother, and they were deployed against the Ammonites. Joab said, If the Arameans are too strong for me, then you are to rescue me. But if the Ammonites are too strong for you, then I will rescue you. Be strong, and let us fight bravely for our people and the cities of our God. The Lord will do what is good in his sight. Remember that this book, First and Second Chronicles, is written when the Jews had returned to the land, having been exiled for 70 years. They've returned and there's rebuilding work to do. And how are they to rebuild? Well, they had enemies opposing them. And so they had to have their trowels in one hand and their swords strapped to their sides. And they had to have trumpets ready to sound the alarm. And it is something very reminiscent of the story that we're reading here. Because if fighting broke out at one section of the wall, then they could sound the trumpet sound the alert, and the people from other places would come and help them. And I guess this story is being told so that 
the point would get across as an encouragement so that the message would be be strong and let us fight bravely for our people and the cities of our God. The Lord will do what is good in his sight. That's what it all comes down to. He's saying, look, we are doing the same thing now. Don't be discouraged, be encouraged because look what happened then and Let's read ourselves what happened next. Verse 14, Then Joab and the troops with him advanced to fight the Arameans, and they fled before him. When the Ammonites realised that Arameans were fleeing, they too fled before his brother Abishai and went in, inside the city. So Joab went back to Jerusalem. After the Arameans saw that they had been routed by Israel, they sent messengers and had Arameans brought from beyond the river Euphrates with Shophak, the commander of Hadadezer's army, leading them. When David was told of this, he gathered all Israel and crossed the Jordan. He advanced against them and formed his battle lines opposite them. David formed his lines to meet the Arameans in battle and they fought against him. But they fled before Israel, and David killed 7,000 of their charioteers and 40,000 of their foot soldiers. He also killed Shophak, the commander of their army. When the vassals of Hadadezer saw that they had been routed by Israel, they made peace with David and became subject to him. So the Arameans were not willing to help the Ammonites any more. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, ooh, we know that phrase before, and we're not told the whole story, but we know that phrase. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, Joab led out the armed forces. Joab, not David. He laid waste the land of the Ammonites and went to Rabbah and besieged it, but David remained in Jerusalem. Job attacked Rabbah and left it in ruins. David took the crown from the head of their king. Its weight was found to be a talent of gold and it was set with precious stones and it was placed on David's head. He took a great quantity of plunder from the city and brought out the people who were there, consigning them to labour with saws and with iron picks and axes. David did this to all the Ammonite towns. Then David and his entire army returned to Jerusalem. In the course of time, war broke out with the Philistines at Giza. At that time, Sibekai, the Hushathite, killed Sippai, one of the descendants of the Rephaites, and the Philistines were subjugated. In another battle with the Philistines, Elhanan, son of Jair, killed Lani, the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, who had a spear with a shaft like a weaver's rod. Very, very long, in other words. El Hanan, son of Jaya, killed Lami. How many brothers did Goliath have? Hmm. Verse 6. In still another battle which took place at Gath, there was a huge man with six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, twenty-four in all. He also was descended from Rapha. When he taunted Israel, Jonathan, son of Shimei, David's brother, killed him. There were descendants of Rapha in Gath, and they fell at the hands of David and his men. Other descendants. Mm. Right, anyway, let's keep going. Verse, uh, sorry, chapter 21. Verse 1, Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. If you look up the parallel passage of this, or parallel passages, you'll see a very different perspective. And you might be tempted to ask, well, which one's correct? And the truth is, they are both correct. They are both God's word. It is the same event looked at at a different angle. Anyway, I'm not going to go into all that now. Maybe I will later. <clears throat> Verse 2. So David sent, said to Joab and the commanders of the troops, Go and count the Israelites from Beersheba to Dan, then report back to me so that I may know how many there are. 
But Joab replied, May the Lord multiply his troops a hundred times over. My lord the king, are they not all my lord's subjects? Why does my lord want to do this? Why should he bring guilt on Israel? The king's word, however, overruled Joab. So Joab left and went throughout Israel and then came back to Jerusalem. Joab reported the number of the fighting men to David. In all Israel, there were 1,100,000 men who could handle a sword, including 470,000 in Judah. But Joab did not include Levi and Benjamin in the numbering because the king's command was repulsive to him. This command was also evil in the sight of God, so he punished Israel. Then David said to God, I have sinned greatly by doing this. Now I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing. What makes David different from Saul? What makes David different from all the evil kings of Israel and Judah that would come after him? The key thing is that when he messed up, he acknowledged it before God and he asked for forgiveness. For his guilt to be taken away. It's not that David was perfect. It's that he acknowledged he's not perfect. And he came to the Lord for forgiveness. That's the big difference. Saul messed up. But David probably messed up in a bigger way. To begin with at least. Anyway. Let's keep reading. Verse 9. The Lord said to Gad, David's seer. Go and tell David, this is what the Lord says. I'm going, I am giving you three options. Choose one of them for me to carry out against you. So Gad went to David and said to him, This is what the Lord says. Take your choice. Three years of famine, three months of being swept away before your enemies with their swords overtaking you, or three days of the sword of the Lord. Days of plague in the land, with the angel of the Lord ravaging every part of Israel. Now then, decide how I should answer the one who sent me. David said to Gad, I am in deep distress. Let me fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercy is very great. But do not let me fall into human hands. So the Lord sent a plague on Israel, and 70,000 men of Israel fell dead. And God sent an angel to destroy Jerusalem. But as the angel was doing so, the Lord saw it and relented concerning the disaster and said to the angel who was destroying the people, Enough! Withdraw your hand. The angel of the Lord was then standing at the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. I want to click where it says Aruna in verse 15. The Hebrew Ornan, a variant of Aru Areuna. Areuna. Verse 16. David looked up and saw the angel of the Lord standing between heaven and earth with a drawn sword in his hand extended over Jerusalem. And David and the elders, clothed in sackcloth, fell face down. David said to God, Was it not I who ordered the fighting men to be counted? I, the shepherd, have sinned and done wrong. These are but sheep. What have they done? Lord, my God. Let your hand fall on me and my family, but do not let this plague remain on your people. Who is the angel of the Lord? The one sent from God, who speaks as God and acts as God is, who we know as Jesus. And David saw Jesus in power, in judgment, and David foreshadows the mercy and justice of God, of Jesus, the Messiah. That He says he is the representative. May he suffer. 
thing, what is the big difference here between David and Jesus is Jesus stands in for our sin. We are the responsible party and yet Jesus takes ownership of our wrongdoing and he suffers in our place. And it's backwards here, isn't it? David sinned and the people suffered. But Jesus, when he comes, he does something far greater. He died on the cross for our sin. Right, verse 18. Then the angel of the Lord ordered Gad to tell David to go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arauna, the Jebusite. So David went up in obedience to the word that God had spoken in the name of the Lord. So notice that it's the angel of the Lord who ordered Gad to tell David to go up. And then what do we read in verse 19? So David went up in obedience to the word that God had spoken in the name of the Lord. So that's why I say, who is this one who is called the angel of the Lord? But he speaks as God and he acts as God. He is the Lord from the Lord. An angel means sent one. That's why this is Jesus before Bethlehem. Verse 20. While Arauna was threshing wheat, he turned and saw the angel. His four sons who were with him hid themselves. Then David approached, and when Arauna looked and saw him, he left the threshing floor and bowed down before David with his face to the ground. David said to him, Let me have the sight of your threshing floor so that I can build an altar to the Lord, that the plague on the people may be stopped. Sell it to me at the full price. Arauna said to David, Take it. Let my lord the king do whatever pleases him. Look, I will give the oxen for the burnt offering, the threshing sledges for the wood, and the wheat for the grain offering. I will give all this. But King David replied to Arauna, No, I insist on paying the full price. I will not take for the Lord what is yours or sacrifice a burnt offering that costs me nothing. So David paid Arauna 600 shekels of gold for the site. David built an altar to the Lord there and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. He called on the Lord and the Lord answered him with fire from heaven on the altar of burnt offering. Then the Lord spoke to the angel, and he put his sword back into its sheath. At that time, so now we have the Lord speaking to the angel of the Lord. Trinity in the Old Testament, anyone? Verse 28, at that time, when David saw that the Lord had answered him on the threshing floor of Arauna, the Jebusite, he offered sacrifices there. Here we go. The tabernacle of the Lord, which Moses had made in the wilderness, and the altar of burnt offering, were at that time on the high place at Gibeon. But David could not go before it to inquire of God, because he was afraid of the sword of the angel of the Lord. Then David said, The house of the Lord God is to be here, and also the altar of burnt offering for Israel. So what we've just read that traumatic episode of judgment, of mercy, of salvation, of redemption. That is the site where it's the Temple Mount. It's where the temple would be. That's the story behind it. Which moves us on to the preparations for the temple. Thank you, Heading. Verse 2. So David gave orders to assemble the foreigners residing in Israel and from among them he appointed stone cutters to prepare dress stone for building the house of God. He provided a large amount of iron to make nails for the doors of the gateways and for the fittings and more bronze than could be weighed. He also provided more cedar logs than could be counted for the Sidonians and Tyrians had brought large, it's Tyre isn't it, Tyre? Tyrians, <laughs> Tyrians is easier to say, and had had brought large numbers of them to David. 
David said, My son Solomon is young and inexperienced, and the house to be built for the Lord should be of great magnificence and fame and splendour in the sight of all the nations. Therefore I will make preparations for it. So David made extensive preparations before his death. Then he called for his son Solomon. I'm just very aware that as we serve Jesus, we are to have a similar attitude that David had. We want to do the Lord's work in our day, but we also need to be mindful of how we can prepare for the work to continue and to be even greater in the days after we've gone. It's a good pattern to follow. Verse 6. Then he called for his son Solomon and charged him to build a house for the Lord, the God of Israel. David said to Solomon, My son, I had it in my heart to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. But this word of the Lord came to me. You have shed much blood and have fought many wars. You are not to build a house for my name, because you have shed much blood on the earth in my sight. But you will have a son who will be a man of peace and rest, and I will give him rest from all his enemies on every side. His name will be Solomon. And let's click that footnote. Solomon sounds like and may be derived from the Hebrew for peace, shalom. And I will grant Israel peace and quiet during his reign. He is the one who is to build a house for my name. He will be my son and I will be his father. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Now, my son, the Lord be with you. And may you have success and build the house of the Lord your God, as he said he would as he said you would. May the Lord give you discretion and understanding when he puts you in command over Israel so that you may keep the law of the Lord your God. Then you will have success if you are careful to observe the decrees and laws that the Lord gave to Moses for Israel. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. I have taken great pains to provide for the temple of the Lord a hundred thousand talents of gold, a million talents of silver, quantities of bronze and iron too great to be weighed, and wood and stone. And you may add to them. You have many workers, stone cutters, masons and carpenters, as well as those skilled in every kind of work, in gold and silver, bronze and iron, craftsmen beyond number. Now begin the work, and the Lord be with you. Then David ordered all the leaders of Israel to help his son Solomon. He said to them, Is not the Lord your God with you? And has he not granted you rest on every side? For he has given the inhabitants of the land into my hands, and the land is subject to the Lord and to his people. Now devote your heart and soul to seeking the Lord your God. Begin to build the sanctuary of the Lord God, so that you may bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and the sacred articles belonging to God into the temple that will be built for the name of the Lord. And we'll leave it there for now. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you again soon. God bless.